I was actually trying to point out two kinds of changes. One was a shift away from the British canon or the Western canon to texts which are from uh, one's own location, so to say. Uh, and the second was about how to complicate that idea of location. Now, this also raises some interesting uh, issues at the moment. Like recently, you know, about a few months ago, I had an opportunity to, to be part of two different kinds of conversations which were trying to move away from a dominant Western framework of knowledge to think about issues of culture. Yeah. One of them was uh, trying to, one of them was a conference on what was called concepts from the global south. Yeah. So concepts from the global south. So insofar as conceptuality is central to uh, that conference, uh, it is not of an empiricist focus, it is rather of a theoretical focus. Like, what are the concepts which come from the global south, which we can actually identify and think about? Now, we know that a large number of concepts that we use while analyzing material from uh, our own locations comes from the Western framework of knowledge. Yeah? A lot of them actually come from uh, the Enlightenment and the kind of philosophical transformations which accompanied that. But some of them also have a longer lineage going back to Aristotle or Plato, you know, to the history of philosophy itself, Western philosophy itself. It's not like concepts from uh, uh, places like India are not at all used by Western thinkers or people who write uh, in the in Western context, but often they are used only when they attend to material from these locations. One may invoke a particular concept from the Indian tradition to comment on an Indian text, or uh, similarly from Islamic uh, uh, reflections or philosophy to comment on some religious practices associated with Islam. But otherwise, the, what is understood as universal is essentially a Western epistemological frame. And it's also interesting to notice what kind of concepts travel from the East to the West. Often you find concepts like uh, dharma, for instance. Concepts which are uh, of a Sanskrit or classical origin, you know, which have a kind of quasi-religious connotation, which become available for this transaction or travel. But you may not get concepts from vernacular Indian languages, for instance, traveling that easily. Of course, there is one place where they travel. That is in anthropological writing. You will see, if you look at any Western anthropologist who have spent time with Indian communities or African communities, you will f uh, find glosses on a large number of words which are part of the ordinary language of the community they live with and trying to speculate on the different balances they have, etc., etc. So in other words, places from the non-Western world appear as available to a conceptual discussion, not in terms of universality, but in terms of an anthropological particularization. The very impulse of anthropology, you know, traditionally has been that, that you have a strange culture which looks unintelligible before you, and sometimes you may not even know the language. You in, you stay with them, you spend time with them, you live with them, so to say, you know. And through that practice of living and observing, you try to make that life world with its practices, customs, etc. intelligible. Yeah. And anthropology has a 
a problematic history in close relationship with uh, uh, colonialism, as you know. Yeah. No, even see, contemporary anthropology is not in that colonial frame. It is. It's also critical of its own disciplinary history. Yeah. And there are many, many very interesting things to learn from contemporary anthropology, because anthropology is one discipline which is actually not a textual discipline. It is really a discipline about practices. So in that sense, for uh, people like us who study literary texts or historical documents or texts of political thought, uh, uh, people of that kind, it would be very interesting to pay attention to a discipline which is not so focused on texts as much as uh, about on practices. Yeah? So there is a need to kind of interrupt the textual obsession of disciplines like ours by an awareness of practices, because texts themselves may actually uh, may, may not work based on their meaning, but on the kind of practice that they, uh, they are engaged in. Like, we are, we are all aware of this. Like, think about religious texts. No. Now, it's not essential that a believer understands the religious text. Yeah. It's not even when the recitation of the religious text is an essential element of religious practice. It does not mean that you are actually cognitively taking in the meaning of the religious text. Recitation may not be so closely linked to the grasping of meaning like the way we do with other texts which are aimed at imparting knowledge. Yeah. Yamas Nambudirapad's autobiography, you remember he speaks about learning the recitation of Vedas, the Uthuvadikindra. And uh, uh, there are great uh, skills are imparted in this because it's part of the training of memorizing. So there are competitions of reciting the Vedas forward and backward as well. So for that, you need to know every words which you have been taught completely. It should be at your command to, uh, to recite it backwards. Yeah? But you are not taught the meaning of the verses. Yeah? So this is not a cognitive activity. It's, it, if you approach it with the kind of methodological tools of textual reading, you may not quite understand what is going on. Whereas we are attending to a practice. It's a practice that we need to look at there. Yeah? Now, to come back to this question of concepts from the Global South Conference. See, the aim there was actually to look at uh, uh, concepts which are from the non-Western world used in a particular uh, literary or intellectual culture, intellectual culture, let's say, which also includes the literary, and which is not a translation of a dominant concept from the West. Because we know that a lot of concepts which we find in modern Indian languages, for instance, they came as translations of concepts from Western writing. Western thought, for instance. Now, this is not accidental. If you have colonial governance, then in terms of the legal framework itself, you need to have these concepts. Otherwise, the, the structures of law and structures of governance themselves cannot actually be translated to the new context. Yeah? Now, uh, the, so we had a large number of presentations which were extremely fascinating, very, very interesting. Uh, but I was also kind of disturbed by uh, one assumption or one desire at the heart of this. You know. The desire there was actually to find something pure and uncontaminated by contact with the Western world. Yeah? So uh, there was an assumption that in these intellectual cultures, there are some elementary or fundamental rubrics of thinking or tokens of thinking which are still untouched by globalization, colonialism, the complex encounters with the Western world. Now the encounter with the Western world does not need to happen through an encounter with a Western entity. We know that in the context of India, it has happened through 
the urban English educated people, sometimes people who worked in ships which uh, uh, traveled the imperial geography. You know? So it can happen in a variety of ways. Or it can happen in the form of the coming of Christianity you know, in many parts of India. You know? uh, so all this can actually uh, be encountered to the best. So here there was some kind of what looked like a kind of nativism of a different kind. Look, trying to look for something which is untouched by the West, untouched by the global North, so to say, and which one can recover. You know? Because this needs to be recovered because it has been overlaid by entire histories and ways of thinking and ways of using concepts which are all implicated in what we call uh, the idioms of the Western. So just as efforts of this kind always have a kind of inherent challenge at the heart of it. Yeah. On the one hand, you want to mark a difference, what is particular, what is not fully assimilable into the global Western epistemological frame, you know, which I think is a very valid and interesting project. I speak for probably about uh, 40 minutes or so until around 4.15. And then we can actually take up questions and uh, respond to them. So uh, in the first half towards the end, I was actually trying to point out two kinds of changes. One was a shift away from the British canon or the Western canon to texts which are from uh, one's own location, so to say. Uh, and the second was about how to complicate that idea of location by moving away from a hegemonic nationalist framing, either by looking at transnational circulations. So if, when, the concepts, whenever we invoke a concept, we are invoking it in relationship to a neighborhood of other concepts. Like think about the concept of rights or the concept of freedom, the concept of religion, you know. Any of these concepts you cannot actually think of it in complete isolation. For for one for an instance, think about the word spirituality. Yeah. Like in our times a lot of people, if you when you ask them, are you religious? They would say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Yes? Uh, you know, so what does it really mean? The idea of spirituality itself, in some sense, is dependent upon the concept of religion. You know? So without some kind of invocation of a landscape, a geography, a neighborhood of concepts in their proximity, in their mutual differentiation, you cannot really have a discursive use of concepts. The second thing is that concepts are used in terms of a syntax. It's not like you, you just invoke a concept, and that is it. When we use concepts, we are connecting them with other concepts. We are arranging them in terms of propositions, arranging them in terms of theses, etc., etc. Yeah? And these ways of connecting also have their histories. It's not like an uncon seemingly uncontaminated concept remains uncontaminated when we begin using it in forms of connections which come exactly from the tradition of Western learning or logical argumentation in the Western world or the kind of academic discourse which comes from the Western world, etc. Et so the conference in the Global South was interesting in that sense because our entire discourse was in the language of the Western Academy. We, we cannot call it the Western Academy anymore, the globalized academy. Yeah? So in that sense, its protocols, its elements, the, 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 the way in which we would validate or invalidate arguments, challenge arguments, etc., really come, came from the modern disciplines which belong to this globalized academy. But using that apparatus, we were trying to zoom into some concepts which still offered uh, a distance or some, uh, some difference, so to say.
from the conceptual stock of Western Academy. Now, it's not very clear whether a project like this would result in an assimilation of these concepts into the global framework of the Academy, whether they would be assimilated not really as essential concepts which will participate in that entire network of concepts which are available for use globally, but rather as indicating a particularity. That is, in this country, in this place, they think this way. That is the anthropological moment that I was speaking about. The second uh, conference which I attended, uh, it was a small uh, group discussion, which was, uh, it was actually aware of this danger. Uh, and the argument which was made by the people who organized it was that even the rubric of the Global South, in some sense, is part of a kind of strategy of the contemporary global academy. Yeah? Uh, an implicit strategy of the contemporary global academy, which would want to elicit information from whatever it does not know. So anthropology is the classical paradigm of it. Like, you have the notion of somebody who is a native informant. Yeah? You go to a new place in order to understand the customs and practices, how do you find out? You live with the people there, but then, Periodically, you may also have conversations. Conversation with the village headman, somebody who is teaching there, etc., etc., who would give you information. Yeah. When uh, Grierson did the linguistic survey of India, which ran into multiple volumes, this is the centenary of the linguistic survey of India, I think. And uh, uh, there, he has a very large number of native informants who gives him uh, an understanding of uh, descriptions of the features of particular languages, etc., etc. So the argument which is made by the group which uh, uh, organized the second event was that uh, there is a kind of attempt uh, in the global the hegemonic uh, structuring of the global academy that the non-Western is reduced to the particular, it is reduced to the level of the native informant. The native informant only provides you with raw materials. The intelligibility of what the native informant supplies, the theorizing of that really happens in terms of the protocols of the Global Academy. So how do you resist that? Now, nobody would you know, suggest that one should not uh, do work on one's own culture, but how do you do it in a way which actually resists this appropriation as the particular? This is really the question which was being posed. And the way in which they tried to go about it was actually to look at uh, some of the thinkers from the non-Western world. Uh, like uh, uh, they can be artists, they can be political thinkers, you know, uh, so social thinkers, what we call spiritual thinkers or religious thinkers. You know, and, but think of them not as a particular thinker, but as a thinker who would be of universal significance. Yeah. For example, if you're working on Narayana Guru, think of Narayana Guru as a global thinker in that sense. Now, global thinker is probably a wrong term to use there. A thinker of global relevance, yeah? A thinker who is available globally, like the way Immanuel Kant is available globally. Rousseau is available globally. So how do you do that? Without getting into information supply. Because often what happens is that when it comes to the non-Western context, the demand on the scholar is to gloss and supply information rather than make the thought itself available for use. Yeah? So you supply thick descriptions detailing biographical information, philological information on concepts and words, etc., etc. But with this entire trapping, you also immobilize the thinker and the thought. Yeah? 
it prevents it from moving, prevent, prevents it from actually getting used. So we had a discussion. The, the thinker artist we took was uh, the very famous uh, Bengal, Bengali film director Ritu Katak, you know, who made his films in the uh, 1960s and 70s. You know. And the idea there was to look at his films and writings without uh, bringing him back into Bengal and embedding him in Bengal. So the people who organized it were very uh, careful not to invite film studies scholars and Bengalis, because both of them, they thought, would actually, uh, uh, of course, there was uh, one film studies scholar and one Bengali to give information when it was required. But the idea was otherwise to make it claimable by other people so that you can think with it. Now, the, the main uh, reason why I invoked these two conferences uh, or, or these two events or frameworks of discussion is to point to a problem that we all face in our own research. Like, on the one hand, there is a paradigm which is so dominant in global academy, of which Indian Academy is also a part, where the theory comes from the West and the object comes from your locality. So earlier when I spoke about the application of theory to particular texts, already it is very clear that the theory would be coming from the canon of theory in the Western world. Yeah? And the text, on the other hand, if you're working on Indian material, it actually is the local element. Now, the local element does not really induce a need to rethink the theoretical frame. The theoretical frame is sometimes extended in its own terms to accommodate it, at most. But otherwise, the idea here is that this conforms, or this actually makes sense the moment you look at it through this theoretical frame. Yeah? This is one kind of approach which has been so, so much there. But against this, there is another kind of approach which now is becoming very strong because of political reasons. But it also was there for a long time. That is that we Indians should work with Indian concepts. Yeah? So you, we should work with the rasa theory if we are looking at poetry, for instance, or drama, for instance. Yeah. And not only if you look at ancient texts, but even if you look at contemporary texts, why not look at it using Indian aesthetic theory concepts? Similarly, when you're looking at politics, look at it using Indian concepts of political thinking. Like, there are people like uh, 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 Sanjay Subramanian, David Truman, Vilcher Narayan Rao, these people who actually work on the 17th and 18th centuries, you know. Uh, and they have tried to make this argument about uh, a whole vocabulary of discussion around the concept of niti, which was dominant in the discussions of state, statecraft, which gave way to uh, a modern preoccupation with dharma as distinct from niti. Now, this is actually one of the good instances of the use of Indian concepts, because you're looking at material from a period where these concepts were actually live and ready for everyday use. Yeah? But I have also seen uh, essays on Sylvia Platt's poetry on the basis of rasa theory, for instance, you know, and looking at modern literature in terms of the rasa theory. Now, this kind of thing actually poses major problems, because the problem is that the rasa theory, uh, as it uh, was elaborated, uh, had very close connections with the kind of practices and the kind of subjects that were involved in the creation and reception of poetry and drama. Now, if you look at many of the prescriptive things about the poet, the poet needs to lead a certain kind of life. The poet needs to have a certain routine. There are, the, the poet is actually not the anonymous 
poet, that the modern idea of literature is that anybody can become a poet. Yeah? That is the modern idea. About that, and if you have time, I'll say something. But at this time, there is the idea that the poet is a distinctive kind of subject whose place is clearly demarcated. Yeah? And similarly, the Sakhridaya, or the person who is capable of receiving uh, the work of art, is also an identifiable subject with certain features. The Sakhridaya is not equatable with the modern idea of the public. There is a difference between them. Now, th th this is not merely a question of empirical features which are recommended for this uh, poet and the Sakhridaya. But there are also other things, like the very idea of aesthetic act, what we translate as aesthetic activity, or artistic activity, and how it relates to other spheres of life, and how it relates to the different goals of life, the entire framework of thinking is very different. The notion of uh, the Purusharthas, for instance, you know, uh, and the notion of the different uh, uh, stages of one's lives, the different kinds of dharmas, even dharma itself is actually a concept which is modified. So within what is called the Indic frame from which these concepts are taken, you already have uh, a deep set of connections between these concepts and the coordinates of the way in which life activities are understood and the subject, subjects are understood at that time. Now, when you move into uh, modern times, it is actually not clear whether the same categories can do the function in a totally different context of life, where life activities, their meaning, their goals, etc., are totally modified. So people once in a while speculate, should the rasas be only nine, or should we add more rasas to take into account modern uh, experiences like angst or alienation or things of that kind? You know, these kinds of questions come up. But the problem is a deeper one. You know, the, the, the problem is really about what do we understand by this aesthetic activity? How does it relate to the idea of the subject and other kinds of activities and goals of life. Once that changes, it is not at all clear that these concepts can automatically be put to work. I'm not saying that they cannot be put to work, but they are not more available to us than the so-called Western concepts are. Sometimes they are even more distant and remote because of the way in which life and the aesthetic sphere are structured in modern times has more to do with the concepts which have come from this global epistemological frames, which are essentially of Western origin and, and of course sustained by the history of imperialism and globalization. Yeah. Now, the crucial word which is missing in what I was speaking about in the context of globalization is of course capitalism. Because we know that a lot of the things which we do not really specify uh, and which we kind of cover up under the blanket concept of modernity have specifically to do with things like capitalism. And capitalism, as you know, by its very structure and very organization of production is universalizing. Universalizing not because it has grasped some more essential principle, but because it conquers everything that remains outside of it. It extends itself, adapts itself, and appropriates it to, with everything which is outside it. So things like uh, uh, agriculture, for instance. In our, our times, agriculture cannot be contrasted with uh, uh, industry in terms of the relations of production so much, because you have agricultural workers. Think about Kerala. Kerala is the great example of this. The, with the cash crops, you know, for a long time, already the agrarian relations undergo change. You know. And so commodity economy comes in. These are essential to the notion of capitalism. Now, it doesn't mean, I'm not suggesting that, therefore, everywhere it's the same thing. That's not what I'm suggesting. But in talking about universality, 
we also need to understand when we say that certain things are available to us as universal. At the heart of it, there is also this problem of capitalism and global capitalism and the relationship within which localities are uh, placed in, in, in the context of that. Now, is that the only idea of universality that is possible? Like, when we say universality, is it a kind of sameness? Is that the only idea of universality that uh, we can work with? There should be some other idea of universality. There should be something which is opposed to particularity, yeah. which, which does not mean the sameness of everything, but something which does not lock us into the particular and without any kind of translatable frame of meaning or intelligibility. That is, when we identify concepts from our own culture or look for theoretical arguments from our own culture, is there some way in which they can claim a validity which is not absolutely dependent upon the fact that I am from the, that location, I am working on text from that location, so to understand that we need these concepts. In other words, can we take it away from this confinement to the particular? This is the question that I ask. Is it clear? Yeah? See, there we have to understand that one way to think of the universal is to see it as having an impulse to break out of that enclosedness. That is, so long as the self-evidence of that enclosed space that we call India or Indian culture or tradition or a particular community is broken. Once we problemize it and break it up, then already there is a moment of universalization happening there. It does not need to take the form that everywhere it is the same thing, but this self-enclosed world, that is, what I am doing is merely glossing my community, my location. Once that is resisted, once that is opened up, then I think already there is the possibility of some kind of connection some kind of uh, 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 comparisons, some kind of uh, networks of connections which become possible. So that this identity or this particular truth of an experience or a thought is not seen as merely belonging to this one particular community at a particular time. But from that, there is something which can travel, which can be identified, and which may still not be the same structure of experience which happens everywhere. Tomorrow I would like to take up that example a bit more, because part of it is also related to some of the work I do, and uh, uh, Sanjay Palshika, who is coming to speak, he has also written about this. See, think about uh, the question of uh, caste stigma. Now, in the context of Dalit literature, for instance, uh, we have had quite a lot of discussion of uh, uh, the question of stigma. Now, see, to begin with, how do we actually think about caste oppression? Yeah. Uh, caste oppression or the experience of caste oppression? Yeah. Because we deal with this in all of our disciplines, in social sciences as, human, as well as humanities, uh, all the time. And like I said in the beginning of my first lecture today, there is also the changing character of the universities has also made it more inescapable. Like there is a demand that these life realities of social and other kinds of meaning making be part of the way in which we think about uh, Indian literature or Indian society or Indian history or whatever it is. Yeah. But what is caste oppression? Now the question is, is it another, just another example of oppression? Like I have seen a lot of work being done uh, which compares Dalit literature with black literature for instance. Yeah. 
Now, sometimes, uh, see, that comparison is perfectly valid, but comparisons, like the way Dr. Burikal was uh, speaking in the morning, comparison is not the discovery of identity. He said even the older scholars knew that. They would say compare and contrast. You know? So the idea is about the discernment of differences as well. Yeah? So the idea behind this uh, uh, putting together of the Dalit and the Black presumes a lot of analogies between oppression in relationship to race on the one hand, oppression in relationship to caste on the other, you know? and the particular practices of oppression. Now, we know that the practices of caste are variable according to locality, which is why it is difficult to speak about a caste system. Now, like the British in the 19th century, they tried to uh, uh, understand the society which they were governing after 1857, during the imperial period. They were attempt to understand how is this society made up. Because unlike the Western world, you do not have a civil society here. So what would be the equivalent of a civil society? And there is the idea that caste actually should be the one you know, here. We do not understand it, so let's understand it. So you have the census, you have ethnographic studies, all these kinds of stuff which happens. And there, the argument there is that there is a caste system, but we know that caste, unlike the scriptural notion of Varna, is full of local variations and it's so grounded in practice, like who can marry whom, who can eat with whom, who can touch whom, etc., etc. Yeah. So, is it to be regarded as one form of oppression? Is there a universal language of oppression? Is there a universal theoretical frame of oppression? Yeah. This is the problem. See, we are living at a time where, correctly I think, a lot of research happens on notions or experiences of victimhood of various kinds, you know, like patriarchal oppression, traumatic experiences created by displacement. You know. think, think about partition, for example, you know, and uh, Holocaust studies in the context of a lot of research, you know, and, uh, and then uh, stigmatization. So all this actually are about various experiences of victimhood. Yeah. Now, can, one, can the tools with which we attend to each of these configurations of victimhood travel? Are they identical? Are they analogous? Or is there something specific? Is there something uh, uh, specific about each of these forms of oppression or victimhood? So this is really the, the question which I was trying to get at. You know. When I said that uh, there should be some way in which the absolute particularity of something is broken, and at the same time, it should not be assimilable to a language of sameness. You know. This is what I had in mind. That is, if Dalit oppression and the tools with which we attend to it are merely a rehearsal of the tools that we have developed to attend to all other forms of oppression, then of course there is a problem there. Yeah? At the same time, if the Dalit oppression is understood purely as a Dalit matter, then there is again a problem. Because that would be more like an anthropological glossing of this particular form of experience. So something which breaks the particularity, involves a rupture of the particularity, and at the same time, which does not really create this language of sameness to think about a universal theory of oppression, victimhood, etc. That, I think, is very, very important. So the example I wanted to give the Dalit oppression one, I will develop it in uh, uh, tomorrow's uh, uh, class if there is an opportunity. But I just point to it. Like we have uh, uh, an account of the experience of stigma uh, in Dalit uh, uh, literary production as well as Dalit autobiographical production, uh, which has been discussed under the concept of humiliation. 
Now, a very, very important book on humiliation was published a few years ago, edited volume by uh, Gopal Guru, uh, and in which uh, our friend Sanjay Palshikar also has a very important contribution called Understanding Humiliation. I, I recommend that you read that essay at some point, you know, and uh, it's possible I can send it to Saji and, uh, yeah. So, uh, th that entire volume is actually trying to look at humiliation as a central element of the experience of Dalit uh, oppression. Okay. Now, the, the book is interesting because it actually engages with the question, what is specific to humiliation? In other words, what is it that differentiates humiliation from other aspects of Dalit oppression? Now, it's not like they can be separated always. What results in humiliation may actually be other aspects of Dalit oppression. But there is something unique as an experience which happens when we say that I am humiliated by this experience. And at the same time, we also know that humiliation is not an experience that is unique to the Dalit context. When I say humiliation, all of us understand it. All of us had, had experience of humiliation, or we have witnessed experiences of humiliation, or read about them in some context or the other. So we need to have some attention to what is the particular configuration of experience which we call humiliation? What kind of emotion is actually generated in that moment? And how does it figure in the Dalit experience of subjectivity, which is also embedded in structures of oppression, structures of community, structures of displacement, various kinds of things? But at the same time, you develop a set of specific tools of investigation which can open it up to other kinds of connections, other comparisons, without making it part of a language of sameness. Some of you may have read recently in the, in the papers and internet, there was a lot of, uh, there's a very important new book which has come out about uh, uh, the question of caste. It was written by uh, a very important uh, scholar called Aniket Javare. You know? Aniket Javare uh, was a professor of English at Pune University for a long time, and then he moved to Shivnadar University in Delhi. And Aniket's book just came out a couple of months ago. It has just come out in India, and uh, by Orion Blackswan. It's called Practicing Caste. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, Aniket prematurely passed away a, a few weeks ago, you know, and uh, uh, soon after the book came out, unfortunately, he very quickly uh, passed away. So uh, th that is a very, very important book, because Aniket, once again, even as his point of departure and his serious investment is in the question of the Dalit experience, he does, he's not interested in reading Dalit literature as an expression or documentation of Dalit identity. He is more interested in finding something which a concept which breaks that unique self-enclosed particularity. And the concept which he developed in some of his uh, earlier writings is that of destitute literature. Now, this idea of destitution, you know, and Kid's uh, 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 paper has a lot of interesting arguments about it. Destitution is opposed to the notion of institution. Yeah. So destitution is the dismantling of the institution, the setting up, the grounding, etc., etc. And his argument is that uh, destitute literature proposes an ethical task before whoever encounters it. It is this ethical dimension of the destitute which becomes the lens through which Dalit writing is looked at. But it is not an anthropological description of the particularity of Dalit writing. What is identified as forming the kernel of Dalit writing and its force is here opened up, like broken open, 
so that this insight from Dalit writing can actually travel without it becoming the sameness in all experiences of destitution. Yeah? So this is the kind of move that I was trying to indicate when I uh, spoke about an idea of universality or glimmering of the universal, which comes from rupturing you know, the particular, pricing open the particular, but without making it the common currency which can travel in all cases as sameness. So one should be able to say that, look, this conception of the destitute literature, which comes from Dalit writing, makes intelligible certain other contexts without being reducible to it. This is really the, the argument which uh, comes up there. Yeah? So what I'll do is I'll stop now because uh, tomorrow I want to do mainly three things if we have time. First, look at issues of agency as it's a very important uh, concept in a lot of research uh, people in humanities as well as social sciences do. And it also has some relevance for looking at contexts like humiliation or contexts like faith, like religious faith, etc. And secondly, to extend that discussion, to look at uh, researching on things which are closely related to the body, bodily experience, emotional experience, etc., etc., which are not so much about reason and uh, premeditated action on the part of conscious subjects. They, they raise some really fascinating questions for working with theoretical concepts in new ways which are not identical to the way we use uh, enlightenment uh, uh, concepts which, have been, which we have been taught to use. Yeah? And lastly, tomorrow, I would like to conclude by talking about the dominant idiom of theoretical work, which in, in most of the disciplines over the past many decades has been that of the critique or criticism. So what is involved in the critique? What are the limits of it? How does some of these new ways that I hope to indicate tomorrow in the early part of the lecture allow us to think about the critique itself a little bit differently? I think it's important to think about it because in discussions of higher education, one of the ways in which all of us defend humanities and social sciences is by saying that they actually teach critical thinking. Now, so what is this critical thinking? And, and what are its limits, what are its uh, uh, problems in the way it is articulated, what are the ways in which we can work with.